This is the third video in this series on antiarrhythmics, and it will cover the beta blockers. To understand the mechanism of beta blockers, one first needs to understand the role of the catecholamines norepinephrine and epinephrine within the heart. As do many other cell types, cardiac myocytes possess membrane receptors that respond to norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are called adrenoceptors, and which make up a key part of the sympathetic nervous system. There are two major categories of adrenoceptors, called alpha and beta, and each of those have multiple subtypes, which vary in their structure, function, ligand specificity, and location of expression within the body. Within the heart itself, the primary adrenoceptor is the beta-1 receptor. Let's look at how the beta-1 receptor works. So here's the membrane of a cardiac myocyte with a beta-1 receptor sitting here, which is coupled to something called a G protein. G proteins are a large family of proteins, so named because they all bind the guanine nucleotides, GDP and GTP. This particular G protein of interest here is the so-called stimulatory G protein, so it gets a little subscript S. And as is shown, the G protein is a heterotrimer, meaning it has three subunits, all of which are different. Now, the beta-1 receptor can respond to either norepinephrine released by nerve endings from the sympathetic nervous system, or to norepinephrine or epinephrine circulating in the bloodstream after release by the adrenal glands. Binding to the beta-1 receptor by either epi or norepi tells the G protein to release one of its subunits, which then increases the activity of a transmembrane enzyme called adenylyl cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP, also known as CAMP. CAMP, in turn, activates protein kinase A, which then phosphorylates a subtype of the calcium channel called the L-type calcium channel. This phosphorylation increases calcium's entry into the cell cytosol from the extracellular space. There are two effects from this increased calcium entry. First, in cells which only experience the slow action potential, such as those in the sinus and AV nodes, the increased calcium current causes the normally slow calcium-dependent depolarization of those cells to be more rapid. This results in an increase in the sinus rate and a modest increase in the AV nodal conduction velocity. Second, the increased calcium influx triggers an increased release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum within the myocyte. The subsequently dramatically increased intracellular calcium binds to a protein called troponin, which through a few more steps involving actin and myosin, ultimately results in an increase in the strength of cardiac contraction. So in summary, epi and norepi released by the sympathetic nervous system bind to beta-1 receptors in the heart with the primary final outcomes of an increased heart rate and an increase in contractility. At this point, you can likely deduce the effect of beta blockers, a decreased heart rate and a decrease in cardiac contractility. You can also see the essential role that calcium channels play in adrenoceptor action and hopefully you can appreciate why beta blockers and calcium channel blockers have similar effects on the heart and have similar indications in clinical practice. As I'll discuss in the fifth video of the series, it's only a certain subtype of calcium channel blockers called non-dihydropyridines, which have significant overlapping action with beta blockers. There are several important characteristics of beta blockers that help to distinguish the actions indications, and side effects from one another. The most important such characteristic is their receptor selectivity. I just reviewed the actions of the beta-1 receptor, and blockade of beta-1 receptors is common to all beta blockers. As you can see, I've added the qualification that contractility is only reduced acutely. However, for reasons beyond the scope of the series, the chronic use of certain beta blockers in heart failure may actually increase contractility in the long term. Blockade of beta-2 receptors leads to a very modest increase in vascular resistance and leads to bronchoconstriction. Blockade of alpha-1 receptors leads to a moderate decrease in vascular resistance. No conventional beta blockers have clinically relevant action on beta-3 or alpha-2 receptors. Any beta blocker that is relatively selective for beta-1 receptors is referred to as cardioselective. A less but still interesting characteristic of some beta blockers is the presence of intrinsic sympathomimetic activity 
also known as partial agonist activity. This manifests as mild beta agonist effect when background adrenergic activity is low, yet binding of endogenous catecholamines is still blocked when background adrenergic activity is high. As a consequence, these drugs might cause less bradycardia at rest than other beta blockers. Okay, so now we are finally ready to discuss individual drugs. I'm going to talk about eight of them. Four are commonly used for the treatment of arrhythmias, metoprolol, esmolol, which is available only as a continuous IV infusion, acebutalol, and pindolol. And the other four are not typically used for arrhythmias, atenolol, propranolol, carvedilol, and labetalol. Why am I discussing four drugs that aren't generally used as antiarrhythmics in a video series on antiarrhythmics? Well, to highlight differences, particularly when the latter four drugs are very commonly encountered in practice and are occasionally used for arrhythmias. And it's also to emphasize that every beta blocker is unique. They are not completely interchangeable like some other drug classes. For each drug, I'll list the receptors that are blocked at usual doses, mention whether or not they have intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, list their common antiarrhythmic indications, if any, and their other common indications. Starting with metoprolol, it is cardioselective, so predominantly active only on beta-1 receptors. There is no intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. Metoprolol is the most common beta blocker prescribed as an antiarrhythmic. Its indications include rate control of AFib and A flutter, as well as the suppression of premature atrial and ventricular contractions, as well as suppression of VT. Metoprolol has many other non-antiarrhythmic indications, including stable angina, acute coronary syndrome, it's routinely prescribed to patients post-MI, and the extended release formulation called metoprolol succinate is the second line beta blocker choice for treating patients with systolic heart failure, also known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Esmolol is also cardioselective and has no intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. Because it's only available IV, it has no long-term use and is limited to rate controlling AFib and A-flutter in hospitalized patients. Its very short half-life is most well-suited for patients with rapid AFib or A-flutter who are hemodynamically tenuous, but in whom you are trying to avoid cardioversion due to the stroke risk from a lack of anticoagulation. This doesn't come up often, and thus esmolol is a relatively uncommon drug to see used. I'm going to discuss the uncommon drugs acebutalol and pindolol together because they are similar. The major distinction is that acebutalol is cardioselective and pindolol is not. However, they are the only significant beta blockers with intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, which explains their typical indications. They can be used in situations in which beta blockers are indicated in a patient without CAD or heart failure, but when their use is limited by side effects, such as resting bradycardia. They can also be used for a condition called inappropriate sinus tachycardia, which is when a patient has a resting sinus tachycardia all the time without any clear reason. The reason to consider beta blockers with intrinsic sympathomimetic activity here is because patients with this diagnosis tend to be young and tend to be particularly prone to feeling poorly on other beta blockers. I've indicated here that they are probably more accurately considered second line agents because most doctors would first try their patients on a more common beta blocker and only switch to one of these if the patient was intolerant of the first choice. Moving on to the so-called non-antiarrhythmic beta blockers, atenolol is only active on beta-1 receptors. It is used in angina and is commonly used in hypertension. However, please note that it is not superior to placebo for this latter indication. Atenolol is one of those drugs that should usually make you cringe when you encounter a patient on it because there is almost always a better choice of medication for the patient. Propranolol was the first beta blocker to enter into clinical usage and gained its developer, James Black, the Nobel Prize in Medicine. It blocks beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Although it is not typically used as an antiarrhythmic, it has many other uses. For example, stable angina, essential tremor, migraine prophylaxis, and prophylaxis against bleeds from esophageal varices, among other indications. Next, carvedilol blocks beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1 receptors. 
It is the first line beta blocker to use for treatment of heart failure. And last is labetalol, which like carbetalol, blocks beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1 receptors. Labetalol is occasionally used for hypertension. In my experience, I see it more commonly used for treatment of hypertensive urgency and emergency among inpatients than I do as chronic treatment among outpatients, but I don't know if that pattern holds true other places. Despite their versatility, beta blockers have plenty of side effects, which can be divided into cardiac and extracardiac. While the precise frequency of side effects are dependent upon factors such as receptor selectivity, they all more or less lead to the following. Sinus bradycardia, AV block, heart failure exacerbation, particularly if up titrated too quickly in a patient who already has left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Also, if a relatively high dose of a beta blocker is abruptly discontinued, patients can develop a transient beta blocker withdrawal syndrome. This consists of tachycardia, hypertension, anxiety, and a briefly increased risk of sudden cardiac death. Extracardiac side effects include bronchospasm, particularly with the non-selective drugs such as carbetalol, propranolol, and labetalol. Thus, those drugs are relatively contraindicated in asthma and COPD. Beta blockers can also cause or worsen depression, sexual dysfunction, and fatigue. They can lead to something called hypoglycemic unawareness, which is when a diabetic patient develops hypoglycemia but does not experience typical hypoglycemic symptoms, like palpitations, tremor, and anxiety, as these are mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. Last, non-selective beta blockers can facilitate hyperkalemia by partially inhibiting the beta-2 mediated uptake of potassium into cells. This effect is usually very small in most patients, but can be amplified in those who are already predisposed to hyperkalemia, such as patients with chronic kidney disease. That's it for beta blockers. The next video in the series will discuss the potassium channel blockers.